Well, good evening, everyone. Both you, those of you who are here live at the Science Exchange in Adelaide and to our audience on a streaming online uh, through the RIL's website. Welcome. I'm Paul Willis, Director of the Royal Institution of Australia, or RIOS, and I'd like to start tonight by acknowledging that we meet on the traditional lands of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains, and we pay our respects to their elders past and present. Tonight, RIOS presents a Café Scientific, an informal forum for the discussion of the ideas of science. Tonight we're going to look at xenotransplantation, and tonight would not be possible without the generous support of the National Enabling Technologies Strategy, an initiative of the Department of Industry, Innovation, Science, Research and Tertiary Education as an event sponsor. And I do have to draw breath after such a, a long name. The evening will be divided into two parts, starting with three presentations by our guests, a short break, and then the floor opening to questions from you, the audience, both here and at home. Uh, for those watching the live stream, if you wish to ask a question, please send, this, uh, send it to us via Twitter, at RIOS. Uh, we do encourage social media. If you wish to tweet through this uh, event, please use the hashtags hash Xeno, X-E-N-O, or hash R-I-Oz. Um, but if you are in the audience uh, here and you have a mobile phone, please turn it to silent or turn it off because we don't really want it to interrupt the flow of this evening's discussions. And also, unfortunately, the people at home won't be able to enjoy this, but those of you here, the bar will be open through the event, so please feel free to get up and get yourself a drink whenever you wish. Let's get started. There is a worldwide shortage of organs suitable for clinical implantation. It's estimated that around 60% of patients in need of organ transplants die while waiting for a suitable organ to become available. Perhaps there is another source of healthy organs that can be transplanted into people other than organs from unfortunate accident victims. Xenotransplantation is the transplantation of living cells, tissue and organs from one species to another. Human xenotransplantation offers a potential treatment for end-stage organ failure, a significant health problem in parts of the industrialised world. Xenotransplantation could save thousands of patients waiting for donated organs. The animal organ, probably from a pig or a baboon, would be genetically altered with human genes to trick the patient's immune system into accepting it as part of their body. We're developing these technologies now that would allow us to do this and save thousands of lives. But there are significant hurdles. There are immunological barriers such as hyperacute hyper rejection, acute vascular rejection and cellular rejection. There are key differences in physiology between species and the risk of xenozoonosis, transplanting exotic diseases along with exotic organs. There's a seeming, and there's also a seemingly endless stream of ethical questions. Whoa. Tonight, we're going to explore the science of what is possible in xenotransplantation, the potential and the pitfalls, the experiments and the ethics. And we have a distinguished panel to explore this subject with, you tonight, uh, with us tonight. But before we start, we're going to have a little bit of audience participation. Those of you here at the Science Exchange will note that you have clicker pads on your tables. And we're going to ask four simple questions at the beginning of tonight's session, and then we're going to ask them again at the end of tonight's session to see if our discussions have had any difference, uh, uh, any influence on your thinking. So, at the ready, if you have your clicker pad, the first question is, do you think xenotransplantation is, one, ready for the clinic, two, nearing clinical use, three, several years away from implementation, or four, early research? Choose one of those four options now. Don't you love the little countdown in the corner? 
Excellent. Now, we won't be showing you the result until the end of the evening. It's our very cruel way of making sure you don't run out on us. No, it's, it's just so that we can uh, more properly measure any changes in audience opinions. Second question. Do you think there is a need to transplant animal organs into humans? One, yes. Two, no. Three, undecided. Your time starts now. Time starts now. <coughs> now it starts. <sighs> Don't you love working live? Thank you very much. Let's move on to question three. Do you think it is technically possible to transplant animal organs into humans? One yes, two no, three undecided, and your time starts now. Those of you at home must be riveted by this particular part of the show. I do ask you to bear with us. And finally, do you think it is ethical to transplant animal organs into humans? One yes, two no, three undecided. Your time starts now. Okay, lock them away, Eddie. We'll investigate those responses at the end of the evening. Let's get on with tonight's discussions. First up, I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Toby Coates. He's a renal transplant nephrologist at the Central Northern Adelaide Renal and Transplantation Service. Would you please make Tony feel very welcome? <laughs> Toby. Thank you, Paul. And, uh... Thanks everyone for coming along uh, tonight to, to listen to what I hope will be an interesting uh, discussion. I'm looking forward to your questions and uh, interacting with you as much as we can. So I'm a, I'm a transplant nephrologist, which is a, a long word, um, and basically my job is to look after patients with predominantly in-stage kidney disease who are on dialysis, for whom uh, we hope to transplant an organ to improve their quality of life. So I thought I'd give you a few statistics or a few figures, uh, minimal statistics to start off with, just to give you a bit of a feel for the, 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 the strength or the, the, the depth of the problem that we've got. So as of September, the end of September, uh, the most recent figures that we've got, um, there are about 1,000 people uh, in Australia who are waiting for a, for a kidney transplant. And overall, there's probably about uh, 1,600 people waiting for any organ transplant. Now, those doesn't actually sound like very, very large numbers, and I think one of the points I'd, I'd like to make to start off with is that, if you like, those are the official figures. Those are the figures of the people who survive long enough with failed organs to be able, and are well enough, to be potentially considered for an organ transplant. I think if we cast the net a bit further or a bit broader, there would be many, many other people that would actually benefit uh, from having an organ transplant if it was possible to have. And so my own field, which is kidney, kidney transplantation, I can tell you that the, the barrier at the moment is the age of 70. And pretty much if you're over the age of 70, um, we generally don't consider uh, people with kidney failure above that age um, as usually biologically well enough to have a, have a kidney transplant. And that's partly because we have uh, a, a great scarcity of organs that we might be able to transplant. We know from work that's been done around the world that pretty much anybody with end-stage kidney failure, with complete kidney failure, will benefit from a transplant. They will benefit. They will benefit in terms of quality of life and generally in terms of life expectancy. But unfortunately, due to the small number of organ donors that we have and the low number of uh, living donors that we have, we're not able to offer that treatment, uh, the best treatment that we can, to those people. So certainly, xenotransplantation, uh, which we'll talk about with Tony and, and Bernadette here, may potentially offer us uh, an ability to extend those benefits to, to other people that are currently not, not able, to, able to access them. So I think that's the first thing I'd like to, like to say is really, uh, although we do a very good job at the, the resources that we have, we feel that we could probably do more if we had more organ donors and potentially if we had uh, uh, xeno organs available. Having said all of that, um, at this point in time, the best organ for a human is a human organ. And I don't think any of the xenotransplantation solutions that we'll talk about today are yet quite ready for prime time, with perhaps one exception, uh, and that is um, the ability potentially to transplant um, insulin-producing cells or beta cells, which uh, 
come from the pancreas. Uh, and the reason that I think that is ready for prime time, and I'm very happy to expound upon this uh, uh, later on, is that many of you will know, uh, for many, many years, um, we used to treat people with uh, porcine insulin, or pig-derived insulin. And that was an extremely effective treatment uh, without very many side effects or complications at all. So I can foresee uh, a lot of this due to the, the work of the, the man sitting next to me, actually, and I hope you'll hear from all, more from him about this later on, that potentially within the next three to five years that we will see somewhere around the world um, transplantation of, or successful transplantation of pig islets into humans that may well be able to correct the deficiency with type 1 diabetes. So I guess having said all of that, um, Paul very nicely uh, put out some of, the, some of the issues that we need to consider if we're going to talk about transplanting organs. And I, one of the things that comes to my mind um, when I think about this, and we think a lot about this, is the physiology of the organ. And whether or not, um, if you take an organ um, from another species, whether, whether the kidney from, from another animal will do exactly the same as the kidney that the human has. And I think there are a lot of questions uh, experimentally at the moment that, that need to be answered about that before we can, we'd be able to actually proceed to doing a, um, a kidney transplant from, from another species. And that the sort of things that I have in mind pretty much are, uh, you know, will the hormones that your own body produces work normally on the animal organ when it's transplanted into you? But likewise, organs do more than just simple functions. Often many organs, particularly the kidney, will produce hormones itself. Will the hormones that an animal organ makes work on a human? Will it work on the, will it do the same thing that, it's going, that it does inside the animal? And a lot of these things we, we really haven't got the answers for. And that's why I think um, if, when we go to clinical, renal, uh, clinical transplantation and xenotransplantation, we're likely to be starting off with cells first, relatively simple things that do perhaps one or two functions that we can uh, more appropriately model and potentially be more familiar with the fact that they are going to work. And I think the islet is probably, probably the best example of that. So that's pretty much what I, I thought I'd start, put my, my opening gambit out there. Well, thank you very much, uh, Toby. Uh, it's interesting to hear the, the need, if you like, for xenotransplantation. Let's move on. Uh, my next guest is from the Immu Immunological Research Centre of St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, where he's the director. Uh, we have Professor Tony Depeshi. Would you please welcome Tony? Thank you. Uh, I should say, I'm, I'm the ex-director. I retired recently, thank God. Um, so, uh, <laughs> all care and no responsibility now. That usually means that you end up working doubly hard. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> in my case, I'm in the house renovations at present, so completely different. Um, yeah, so I started in xenotransplantation in about 1990. Before that, I ran a kidney transplant service at Royal Melbourne Hospital. And um, the, the need we've all heard about, uh, and that is the driver for this. Now, when I started, it was a, I was a kidney doctor, and it was all about renal transplantation. But passage of time has sort of uh, brought in other interests and other needs. And so that the other organs of interest and need are the pancreatic islets, as we've heard. There are a large number of di insulin-dependent diabetics out there. And insulin therapy has its issues and problems, and it certainly doesn't restore physiologic normality. There are people who need heart transplants, uh, and again, the issue with heart transplantation is again, there are not enough organs. And there are liver transplants and so on. And you'll see across this a spectrum, and you'll see it from single cell, which as uh, Toby said, probably be the first off the, off the blocks, through to very complex organs like a liver, and, the, and that gives you some idea of, of, if you like, the challenges. I would put the pancreatic islet first, uh, like Toby. Uh, I'd put the kidney uh, or the heart second. Now, the heart is probably, a, a, a gives you a, 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 an easy point of reference. A heart I is simply a pump, and it pumps blood around. Uh, but as Toby said, there are physiologic considerations, and one of those considerations is whether an animal is upright or horizontal. And a pig is a horizontal animal. It doesn't have to generate 
the sort of the vertical blood pressure. So that you immediately ask the question, is a pig heart capable of pumping blood, you know, all the way up to the, the top of a vertical uh, person? That's one type of physiological question. Another type of physiologic question is a liver is an extraordinarily complex organ. It makes most of the proteins that circulate in, in our bodies and it uh, responds to a vast number of stimuli and signals. And so that the chances of physiologic compatibility in the two directions is almost naught. And so that the complexities of, of that would be high. But it doesn't mean that liver, liver is an impossibility. It just means that it may be used as a short-term bridge until a human liver becomes available because very commonly what happens in acute liver failure is there is no liver available for a patient. So those, all of these are still, you know, if you like, uh, in, in the relatively uh, near future. Then they are not here this minute and today. And the, the major reason uh, that we can't go ahead with xenotransplantation is that we, we see animals as foreign. Our immune system looks at an animal and says, you're different. And if I get a transplant from Toby, I will reject it without immunosuppression. And it'll take a moderate amount of immunosuppression. And I'm just 70. So Toby wouldn't graft me because I couldn't stand a haircut, let alone a transplant. The point is that as you get older, your immune system, uh, the, your capacity to withstand this whole process uh, falls away. And the immunosuppression that's required to keep Toby's kidney in me is trivial compared to what would be needed to cross the species barrier. So that to try and get around that, we have to make some modifications to the pig donor and I won't go into why all the reasons for the pig, but uh, we can discuss that later. But let me tell you that we've decided that the pig is the donor of choice. But the pig is quite distant from us, unlike a higher primate. Um, the pig is quite distant from us. But interestingly, about 98% of his genome is the same as ours. But it's th where that 2% is scattered is, is the relevance. And it's scattered in just about every uh, cell tissue molecule of our bodies in small amounts. So that what we have to do is pick the important differences that wh why I recognise a pig kidney or a pig pancreatic islet as different and make the relevant changes. And what we found over these years is, first of all, we had to figure out what the main difference was. And what we discovered was that there was a, a blood group, basically a blood group, in pigs that humans don't have and we all have antibodies against it circulating. So that the minute you put a, a vascularised organ in a kidney, for example, into uh, a human, it's rejected within 15 minutes. Bang. It goes black and it's called hyperacute rejection. So that w the one of the first things we had to do was to solve this problem of how do we take that out of the pig? How do we get rid of that blood group? All pigs have it. Now, you might think, well, you know, well, we thought maybe if we do take it out, it'll be lethal. Maybe pigs need this thing for some reason. But in the phylogeny of this world, what we found was that all animals uh, have this except animals that diverged about two million years ago. So that only humans and higher primates don't have it. And there was a bottleneck and some kind of uh, mutation occurred then and off we went merrily without it. So the likelihood is that we could knock it out without being lethal. Well, it took many years to do it uh, and we thought that we could use what called embryonic stem cell technology, which you'll have heard about. And that technology uh, worked beautifully in mice. Uh, and we knocked it out in mice and we patented it and we did all of the things that thought, you know, we'd be in this and be able to 
And it, it has never, we have never isolated the equivalent cell from a pig. So that it wasn't until Dolly the sheep came along with a whole new technology that allowed us to do the genetic manipulation in a cell, one single cell, that we can manipulate the genes in and then pop that into a fertilised ovum that we then enucleate. And so that basically you wind up with a single cell embryo made from an adult nucleus that you've genetically modified. And that's the fundamental technology involved in, in doing the knockout. And lo and behold, the pigs were born. They, were, they, they have only one copy knocked out, so we had to cross, we had to breed them and then cross them. And finally, the, the homozygous knockout <coughs> pigs were born and they were well. So that was an enormous sort of relief to us that, it, that in fact you could knock something out and you absolutely knocked it out, there was none left, and that the animals survived. Now the other type of technology that we use is to put human genes in. And we're not putting human genes in, we, we're putting them in because the pig ones, there's, there's this molecular incompatibility. Those pig genes are there, but they don't work on human substrate. So that it's, it's this problem of being able to shake hands across the species and we need to be able to prevent injury to the cells or the organ you transplant by putting the human protective genes that we all have on every cell of our you know, body, particularly facing the vasculature, the blood supply. And so we then, using what's called transgenic technology, we put a human gene. In fact, it's not actually a gene. It, it, it's a copy of a gene. It's a quite, genes, are, as they exist in us, uh, are like knots in a string, but there's a lot in between. And so what we've done is gather up all the knots and put them together. And those we put in. And so that technology has to be then added to this pig that we've done the knockouts. We add in the human genes. And we add in one and then we, do, we test this. So we take a baboon and we transplant a kidney, a pancreatic island or whatever it is, but the baboon is the surrogate human and we transplant these organs into it without immunosuppression in our case because we know that it'll reject in 15 minutes. And lo and behold, with the gal knockout, they go for this long. And then with the extra genes, they go for that long. And you're out into days. And then if you add immunosuppression, we're out and out to months, many months, six plus months. And it varies depending on the organ. But it's like turning the pages of a book you don't know what you're going to find every time you do this. So that we do one modification and we see the problem that's left. Why did this fail? Well, it's because this happened. So we then go back and we make new modification and we add that in. And all of this takes about two years, each step. And so you're building this genetically modified pig. Now, I think I've probably given you enough at this point and then we can talk about more of that later. Fascinating stuff. Please thank uh, Tony for that. <laughs> we will hear more as the evening unfolds, ladies and gentlemen. Our third and final speaker for tonight is Dr Bernadette Richards. Bernadette is sen a senior lecturer in law at the University of Adelaide, so please make her welcome. Um. Good evening. Yeah, my, my doctor has absolutely nothing to do with medicine, so I thought I'd better say that bit there. Um, yes, I am at the law school, and um, I do have to, to say, well, ad openly admit, you know, there is that question as, what's a lawyer doing talking about ethics? They're two terms that often aren't <laughs> looked at together. The reason that I'm interested in this kind of area is because my major research focus over the years has been on um, medical law, so the law as it operates in the provision of medical treatment and of course in um, medical research. And from that, I then developed this, a, a very strong interest in, in bioethics and the ethics underlying the law because in many situations, and this is a perfect situation um, example here, we have an awful lot of ethical considerations but no law yet. No very, there is no specific law, there is no Xenotransplantation Act. Okay, so 
we need to really enter into the ethical dialogue. And in some respects, uh, we were talking about this earlier, it, it's, it's a good thing that there is no law jumping in ahead. Quite often people say, well, why isn't there a strong regulation of this? Why, why isn't Parliament addressing this right now? Well, because, as you said, we, we don't know where it's going. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And sometimes, if especially particularly prohibitive um, legislation comes into play, that can, can really stop things from happening rather than to facilitate them. So it's important to have the ethical dialogue. Now, ethics is not an in about an individual opinion of what is right or wrong. We all have our very strong individual opinions and uh, sometimes they accord with, with broader <coughs> ethical principles and, and in fact they inform that kind of discussion. But when we're talking about the ethics of something like this, we're talking about the ethics of what, about what makes us thrive on an individual basis, how do we thrive as individuals, and then collectively as a society. So we need to ask a whole series of questions is of how can we thrive as a society and what's the best way to go. And I've just got um, about four headings that I'd like to quickly go through and I am going to refer to my notes because one thing I do have in common with uh, my broader <coughs> legal colleagues is the ability to talk too much. So I'm going to try and keep myself under control here. All right, so there's, these are four headings that came from an NH and MRC, which is the National Health and Medical Research Council guidelines. And they <coughs> raised four broad headings, broad ethical considerations. So the first one, we need to have a look at the ends. This considers the benefits. Who is to benefit from this? Now we've heard about the shortage of um, and, and the desperate need for more organs. It has a, a very high probability or possibility to um, benefit, if we're talking about the, going back to that thriving as a society, to benefit a broader spectrum of our population. Animals can potentially, and I think it is only potentially at this stage, um, provide a source for health care throughout um, society. And it may, um, and the genetic modification of these animals might um, improve, or should, will improve, the um, effectiveness of such transplants. Now, of course, on the other side, there are risks. And I'll have a look at this under the, the heading of consequences. In ethical terms, we actually need to question whether these ends justify the means. And this is where a lot of the discussion does occur, the means, the way that we go about achieving these, these um, quite admirable ends. It is an ethical discussions which then do lead into um, regulation and those sorts of things, is all about that balancing act. And can we be justified? So here we consider the welfare of the recipients and of course the welfare of the donors. In this instance, of course, it is the animals. The humans involved. Now there's been an interesting issue I read in some of the literature, which I must say is not something I'd thought about until I started to read this more deeply, is the issue of perception of self. There's an enormous amount of literature out there, and I spoke very briefly to Toby about this earlier, and he said, yes, he has patients who, who report this kind of thing, where they have this belief that cell life extends beyond the actual death of the donor. So people believe perhaps that they're taking on characteristics of their now deceased donor. Um, a discussion that I was having a look at raised the question of you take the anti-rejection drugs and certain physical changes can, in, can occur, such as the growing of facial hair, the change of your physical appearance, those sorts of things. What do you do with the recipients who then start to think that what's happening is they're actually turning into the animal? So that would involve careful counselling and respect for that belief. Scientifically, I'm not quite sure what the scientists would have to say about that, but it is something, there's an enormous amount of um, literature about that with organ human recipients, I mean, everyone's a human recipient, recipients of human 
organs. You know, um, one article that I read was, in, in, was entitled Transplant with Side Effects on the Soul. Okay, so it is, it's a discussion that's out there and it's one that because it's there, we do need to engage with. Um, and that, that, so there's that crossing of the boundaries. And of course, there's also the issue of vulnerability of those people who take part in the clinical trials because they are suffering from end-stage end organ failure. Is that true and informed consent? Or are they just so desperate that they will go to any measures? So those sorts of discussions have to be considered. And then we go on to, con are you hurrying me up? Then we go on to consequences. Uh, this is, of course, one of the issues that, uh, that, uh, that we discuss is the issue of animal welfare. It's quite often raised in this context. There's two sides to this, the, in the, the welfare of the actual animals and then also the welfare of us. Um, I'll talk about the welfare of us first. As a society, do we want to be, doesn't it say something about us how we treat other species? So what makes us thrive as a society of humans, of respectful humans, of others? It's not only, you know, it's how we treat each other as other humans, but also how we treat lesser species, if that's how you, how you wish to define them. Because, of course, some people don't necessarily always define animals as a lesser species, which, of course, raises the issue of the animal welfare. We have very strong, in this country, controls on... Um, on the way that animals are treated in scientific um, experimentation. There's, there's not this, uh, you know, you, you can't just go out and do as you wish. So we need to consider, do those controls um, operate effectively under the current, uh, un in this context, or do we need some further controls? And of course, finally, there is social significance. As a society, in, it is in our interest to treat each other and animals with respect. So how do we embody that respect? How do we go about doing that? Um, and there's also then that question of the allocation of resources. And uh, I know I'm sitting next to researchers, but we do need to raise this. It is a discussion that needs to be had. Should we be allocating resources here or should the resources be allocated in other areas like the actual health of society that's leading to this, the um, significant um, organ illnesses and those sorts of things. So <coughs> the ethical discussion is all about respect. It's all about respect for ourselves as individuals, ourselves as a society. It is a respect for the um, animals and it's really a discussion I guess I'll come back to that, that, that first point. It's a discussion about what makes us thrive, physically, emotionally, and society, as a society, as a group of human beings. Well, ladies and gentlemen, can we thank Bernadette? <laughs>